so we've got these free parameters of the standard model on the table. We've got the cosmological constant on the table. In the cosmic landscape, you write that the free parameters are very disturbing. The cosmological constant, even more disturbing. But it was the fact that in your research into string theory, it seemed to be pushing you towards this idea of the landscape. That's when you really started to take this solution seriously. So I'd like to turn towards string yeah. theory now and better understand how it leads to the landscape. I can't give you a course in string theory here. Mm -hmm. I, and some of the things I will tell you may sound, um, what shall I say, unmotivated to you. But I will tell you they are a consequence of some sophisticated mathematics of string theory. We'll have to leave it at that. Um, so, string theory is naturally a theory which takes place in higher dimensions than x, y, z, and t, four dimensions, four dimensions of space-time. Its mathematics is not comfortable with four dimensions. It's comfortable with 11 dimensions or 10 dimensions or some other number of dimensions. This was a puzzle in the first day of string theory. It was a very nice theory. It contained all sorts of things that, uh, that we liked about the theory, but the number of dimensions wasn't right. It didn't take long for people to get the idea that some of these dimensions could be wrapped up into very small um, little toruses, little spheres, little, um, what should we call them? Little compact, compactifications. Dimensions so small that, uh, that they might as well, from our big coarse-grained point of view, be essentially zero. The, the right point of view from string theory is that there are four dimensions, x, y, z, and t, which are not wrapped up into these little microscopic um, uh, things. OK, so that, that is how string theory is forced to deal with the fact that space-time is four-dimensional and not, let's say, 11-dimensional. But then how many ways are there of taking a couple of dimensions and twisting them into something small and different, not big and flat and open like our world seems to be to us, but uh, more like a tiny sphere or a tiny torus? Well, the number of ways is, first of all, infinite from a mathematical point of view. Um, the number of little spaces, little manifolds that you can twist space up into is basically infinite. But the number that can satisfy the rules of string theory may not be infinite, but over the period of years that string theory has been around, people have found more and more and more ways um, to compactify space is the word. That the, the technical word is compactify. That means take these 11 dimensions, take uh, seven of them, and wrap them up into something small that are too small for us to move around in, and the remaining ones are the ones that we live in. The number of ways of doing that seems to be at minimum. So the number 10 to the 500 is often quoted. Yeah, I'm speaking to your colleague yeah. Raphael Busso next yeah. week. I think. Yeah, yeah, he was one of the. He was one With of Polchinski, the. Polchinski, uh, I think. Yeah, he and Polchinski were the ones I would say who first realized that string theory had this property. They were not bold enough to say that that suggests the anthropic reasoning, but they were bold enough to say that string theory had that property. So uh, they are the heroes of that particular episode, and they realized it. They counted the number that they were able to identify. I think they got something like 10 to the 500. Right? After that, other people found other ways. It got up to 10 to the 1,000, 10 to the 20,000. I don't know. I, at some point, it stops being uh, interesting to try to count them. Just too many. Um, so that. Uh, that seems to be the case. String theory provides this overarching framework in which there are lots of possibilities. It's like chemistry for the submarines. 
Chemistry is the overarching thing which tells us what possible densities exist uh, for the submarines. String theory is the overarching framework which tells us how many different ways there are of, um, of making a world with four dimensions. And the number seems to be astronomical. You know, some people say, well, at that point, you should have just given up. The string theory isn't getting you anywhere. You should have just given up. Well, no, you don't give up. The giving up is not an option. You can't ignore what you're learning. You can keep in the back of your mind that it could be wrong, and it might be wrong, and you should keep in the back of your mind. But you can't give up when you're learning something new mathematically about what up till now has seemed to be your best theory, the only theory which contains both quantum mechanics and gravity. You can't say, give up. You have to keep going. And um, again, that's where we are now. The more we learn, the more we think that there's this vast landscape out there, that from string theory, a landscape of possibilities. The more we learn about cosmology, the bigger we find the universe to be. The more we find this accelerated expansion, together with the ideas of this bubbling universe, seem to make sense. So there's no option. It's not an option to give up. Those people can give up, but I can't.